Good morning and welcome to North Coast Union Church Online. It's great to be able to connect like this. I hope and I've been praying that uh, all are well and knowing the grace of the Lord in whatever challenges and trials you're facing. I don't know what I want to end first, the lockdown or winter. They're both bad and unpleasant, but I think we got a better chance of winter ending before the lockdown. But through all of this, God is good. He's gracious. He's faithful and he continues to speak to us. It's always amazing to me, every time I just stop for a moment and think about it, that the God of creation, the God of the universe is engaging with us. Not just sending us messages through a third party, but talking to us, speaking to us by his word, by his spirit, into our lives, into our context, and into our circumstances. And it's great that we can turn to God's Word together again this morning and hear God speak. When we open the pages of Scripture, we are engaging with the living God, and He's speaking to us in the Old and the New Testament. The whole of the Bible is a message for us here and now. It's based on history. It's based on situations and contexts and all kinds of fascinating and amazing things. But He's speaking to us right now. And we're journeying together in the book of Amos, and the theme of the study is called Stand for Truth. Amos was called to do that in the midst of the people of God who, again, had wandered so far away from God's will and God's love and God's purpose for them. And this morning, we're going to be looking at the fact that the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior, is the sign that we should focus on 
and look for. There's nothing to look for or see beyond Jesus. He is the sign from God. And that has a whole lot of implications, which are incredibly exciting. Now, you might ask, well, what is, how can you say that about the Old Testament? This is Amos. This is, this is almost a century or at least a millennium before Christ. But the point is that Jesus is on every page of Scripture. And I love what um, Charles Spurgeon said. You can drop me anywhere in the Bible and I will run cross country to Jesus. What a great way of putting it. So we need to see the whole of Scripture through the lenses of the fulfillment of Scripture. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not to say that we ne neglect or ignore the context of the ancient Near East which is the greater context in which Amos lived and the message was proclaimed. We take that all into consideration, and that gives us a fullness. It gives us texture. It gives us color. It gives us many dimensions through which to see the focus of Scripture, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to be reading Amos chapter 4. I'm using the, the New International Version the 1984 edition of that. So let me read the 13 verses of Amos 4. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. The sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness. The time will surely come when you'll be taken away with hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. You will each go straight out through breaks in the wall, and you will be cast out towards Harmon, declares the Lord. Go to Beit El and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering, and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, Israelites, for this is what you love to do declares the Sovereign Lord. I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none, and dried up. People staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Many times I struck your gardens and vineyards. I struck with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig and olive trees. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent plagues among you as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with a sword along with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with a stench of your camps, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a burning stick snatched from, a stick rather, snatched from the fire, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what I will do to you, Israel. And because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel." He who forms the mountains, creates the wind, and reveals his thoughts to man. He who turns dawn to darkness and treads the high places of the earth. The Lord God Almighty is his name. Father, we thank you that we can turn to a word together this morning. We can do that in freedom. And we pray, Lord, acknowledging our dependence on you without you without you the work of your spirit we cannot see you we cannot hear you we cannot we cannot obey you so thank you lord that you are at work through your word in our lives as this message is shared we commit this time to you in jesus name amen so here god has a word to say to his people that is very ominous and foreboding and let's just step back a bit again, just to remind ourselves, why is God going to so much trouble? Well, we've seen at the end of Amos, and we see throughout Scripture, that God's purpose and His desire is for relationship with those He has created. The crown and glory, the pinnacle of His creation, mankind, society, humanity, 
all nations, all tribes, all languages. And because that's the best thing for us, that's the best possible reality we could ever know and experience, God works through circumstances that he brings about to get our attention and bring us back to us. And remember, at the end of Amos, in chapter 9, verses 11 to 15, God promises well-being, peace, the shalom of God, prosperity, which is in every sense the word, which really is summed up again in relationship with God. That's God's desire. And as we see in Hebrews 12, the Lord disciplines those he loves and chastises everyone he calls a son. So even God's discipline is loving. And we remember too that God's discipline is always redemptive. The purpose is always to bring us back to God. So we see here again in Amos chapter 4 that the priority of relationship. And we see the extent to which the people had wandered away from relationship to God. And it opens with some very strong words against the luxury, the, the affluence, the indulgence, the, the overwhelming lust and, and, and desire for more and more pleasure and satisfaction. Hear this, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. It's a picture of that opulence. It's a picture, it's a picture of, of the people of God tragically so obsessed with, with the pleasures of life that they've forgotten God and now they're ordering people around. And, and, and there's a bit of a parody going on here because it, it, the, the word that's used here and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks, it's say to your lords or your masters. Now that is in no way to imply a greater than or lesser than relationship. It's bringing out the irony of ordering somebody to do something that you can very well do for yourself. And in their thirst for pleasure and satisfaction, they are bringing oppression and pain and suffering to other people. That's, that's as we've seen in Amos already, a serious part of the crime. You who oppress the poor and crush the needy. So it's, it's, this, it's this lack of care, lack of concern, lack of consideration for other people in our own pursuit of pleasure. As I run through the suburbs, we go to different places uh, with, with a group of friends, and, and we happened last week to run through um, Sandhurst and, and that area in Santon. Oh, my word, the opulence there is unbelievable. And I'm sorry, but when I walk past or run past, or usually walk because I'm going up a hill, past a wall that I know that costs more than my house and my friends' houses combined, I often wonder, how on earth did you get so much money? I wonder... I have to ask, was it honest? And who suffered so that you could live like this? Now, at every level of society, there is this tendency to, to, to put number one first, look after number one, and, and not to worry about other people. I see it every day on the streets. Look how people drive. There's no consideration for other people. You can get run over, killed, crossing on a pedestrian crossing. I think one of the most dangerous places to be on the roads in South Africa is on a pedestrian crossing as a pedestrian because people just drive right through there. So it's this, it's this total lack of relationship. It's a lack of relationship with God and with each other, which we've seen again and again is those two axes on which we live, the vertical with God, the horizontal with each other. The whole of Scripture is structured around those realities. And, and God turns us around and he says in verse 2, the sovereign Lord. Again, this is, this is, this is heavy duty. These are heavy duty names uh, of God. The sovereign Lord, Adonai, Yahweh, has sworn by his holiness, the time will surely come when you'll be taken away with hooks and the last of you with fish hooks. Now, scholars debate the details of these things where these, where these thorns, these big thorns that, that are, were used to torture and inflict pain, or were they metal hooks, or were they cattle prods? Look, either way, it's a very painful experience. And the picture is you're going to be dragged away from your luxury, dragged away from your couches, dragged away from your indulgence, because you have denied and dishonored relationship with God. And as a consequence of that, you have 
denied other people who are created in the image of God. Now, the cows of Bashan is a fascinating saying because Bashan, which was in the, south, in the northern kingdom, in the area of Samaria, was well known for its great cattle, its, its luxurious, well-fed, prosperous cattle. So these are sleek, fat, prosperous cows living well. And, and so there's, there's this picture here. I was watching a, a program some time ago on, on how the world, how different people around the world eat steak. Apologies to all the vegetarians, but I'm a, I'm a carnivore through and through. So I was fascinated in this program. And so they went to different places of the world and they obviously featured Kobe beef, which is amazing. I believe I've never tasted it, but they went to the farm in Japan and these cows are pampered. Eh? They, they've got very short legs. So they don't need them. They don't walk around. Big, round, fat, sleek, black, shiny um, coats. And, and they're in these pens and they are electronically fed at different times of the day with just what they need. And 24-7, the farmer's playing Mozart to these cows. Not many people in the world of that luxuriously. But there's, there's this picture here of this absolute overriding indulgence. But these cows, God says, will become carrion. They will become what is preyed upon. No longer will they prey on others. They will be preyed upon. And when our boys were younger, we were, um, went back to the Northern Cape where we spent some years of ministry and visited with a friend who was involved in nature conservation. And he said, I'm going to take you to a vulture restaurant. And, and the boys were very excited because they heard the word restaurant. So all very excited. We go out into the bush and we, we come to this field that is just, it's not even carcasses of cows. It's just skeletons and bones in these big rib cages dry bleached bones. Now that's where they take cows that have died and, and the vultures obviously come in and they can study the vultures, photograph the vultures as they feed. So it's called a vulture restaurant. But it was like, it was like a scorched earth experience for my boys. Number one, they weren't getting fed. Number two, all they could see everywhere were these skeletons of these animals. Th that's really the picture here. There's this contrast from, from the opulence to the absolute devastation because why as god says five times in verses 6 to 11 yet you have not returned to me not you have not obeyed my law not you have not you have not observed the ritual because they were very busy doing that and we'll see that in the text but you've not returned to me, once again, the priority of relationship. It's a phrase that speaks of repentance, but it's a phrase that speaks of repentance in the context of relationship. And that's a biblical picture of repentance. Return to me. Return to relationship with me. It's a priority in God's word. It's a priority in scripture. And if we don't learn anything else from the book of Amos, I hope we learn a lot. But if we don't learn anything else, we must remember that we are called to intimate fellowship, relationship. Remember the Hebrew word yada, to know experimentally, intimately, not experimentally, but uh, intimately, uh, deeply. We're called to that relationship with God. We see in verses 4 to 5, those verses I've just mentioned, God says, go to Beit El. Now that's the northern kingdom. That's that um, illegitimate center of worship. Go to Beit El and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering and brag about your free will offering. Boast about them, about them, Israelites, for this is what you love to do, declares the sovereign Lord. So they're going through the motions of religion, but it's devoid of relationship. We could say they were sticking to the letter of the law, but they completely rejected the spirit of the law. 
And ironically and tragically, while they were sticking to the letter of the law, in their hearts, they had become Canaanites, the very people that they were commanded by God to drive out of the land of Canaan because of centuries of disobedience, of rebellion, of opulence, of immorality. And now the people of God are in that very same place. J.C. Shelley says that this way, the point is not subtle. The worship of God has itself become rebellion. The rituals of offering established to atone for human sin and thereby restore the relationship between God and human beings have themselves become occasions for sin. And he goes on to say, Amos anticipates the tireless warnings of Reinhold Niebuhr that it is precisely in their worship this is so important for us, that it is precisely in their worship that human beings are most powerfully assailed by temptation, most prone to temptation in times of worship. And so again, we examine our hearts in our private worship, in our corporate worship, which we're not able to experience at the moment as we are in a way that we're used to, how much of that is for others and how much of that is for God? You know, we Christians, have, we're very good about spiritualizing our sin and, and coming up with biblical reasons to do things that work for us. And sometimes we do that all under the guise of a wor wor worship. But worship is a relationship. Worship is surrender. Worship is being overwhelmed with, with the beauty and the grandeur and the love and the goodness of God. And worship is sacrifice. All of these are expressions of relationship with God because all of those are expressions of God's relationship with us. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, Ephesians 5 says, and gave himself up for her. So there is this reciprocation in this, in this covenant that God has made with us through Christ, his son, made in his own blood. He desires this deep, wonderful relationship with us. So that's the priority of our lives. And I shared this week in, our, in, in the devotion um, that I shared uh, the message from Micah 6, 6 to 8. What does the Lord require? To act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. That, that's a summarized summary of the Ten Commandments. It's a summary of, of Jesus. Love, your, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and your neighbor as yourself. It's a summary of First John that says, God is light in him. There's no darkness. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have... See, it's a given if we're in the light with God. Through Christ, we have fellowship with one another. And the word fellowship, it's more than just eating together because we're very good at doing that. But fellowship is about putting my needs aside, my wants, my desires aside for the glory of God and for the good of the body of Christ. That's true fellowship. And that's another way of talking about relationship. We also see, after the priority of relationship, again this whole issue of suffering, the purpose of suffering. Why do we suffer? Why? Why? What is God doing in COVID? Is God, a, is God in it? And, and we've, we've asked this question throughout history. Um, every time a massive disaster takes place, suddenly, isn't that interesting? Suddenly everybody wants to know where God is. Even the atheists are asking, where's God? And the rest of the time, nobody cares. Maybe that's a reason why, well, part of a reason why some of these things happen is just to get our attention and make us very aware of our dependence on God and our need for God. And there's two main, and we saw this in our study in Revelation too, there's two main reasons uh, or two ways that suffering works, whether it's personal or, or national. Uh, suffering, uh, God deals with, with sin in, in the lives of his people, and he refines us, he purifies us. But he also uses it 
to reveal, as he does here in Amos chapter 4 and elsewhere in Scripture, he uses it to make people aware of the need of him. It's not as I'm mistaking the thought often that it's, it's, a, it's a sign of the end times and these things are happening. No, it's, it's God working to get people's attention in times of adversity and trial to reveal our need of him and in the life of the believer to refine us. And these waters are deep and these valleys are incredibly dark. And as a pastor, I'd never make light of suffering. I never want to be trite about it. I never want to get um, theoretical about suffering because we are all experience it. And many, many people I've been privileged to share life with and journey with them experience suffering on a level I can never even imagine. But that doesn't negate the truth of that God is at work here. We're, we're not victims of fate. We're not victims of evil. And for some of us, maybe it jars our theological understanding, our, our worldview, that, that God, God brings these things about and God allows and God uses. But God is absolutely sovereign and God is at work. So let's see. Let's have a biblical worldview, a big picture understanding of who God is, and God brings His purposes about through suffering. And over and above that, in the context of, of a biblical worldview, a Christian worldview, this is not all there is. Praise God for that. We have the hope of glory, Christ in us. We have the absolute assurance of being with Him and only then, when we're in glory with the Lord Jesus, will we be able to see this life for the, what it really is and the way we should see it. And until that point, we walk in faith, we walk in trust, and we walk in surrender. And we want to partner with God in what He's doing in our lives and what He's doing in the world in which we live. And it's a clear teaching right throughout Scripture that God uses suffering in the, in, in the lives of nations and the lives of individuals. I'm fascinated to see what's happening uh, of late in Turkey and because I had the privilege of being there a couple of years ago on a fascinating study tour. And it was just, that was an amazing couple of weeks. It was kind of like trying to take a drink from a fire hydrant. It was just intense, intense, but it was really good to be there. And I remember being in one of the museums in, in Istanbul and, and there were these great murals on the walls, these mosaics of, of lions and different kinds of beasts, big, fearsome, scary beasts. And those mosaics had been taken from the entrance to Babylon. Now, what's the significance of that? Remember that the southern kingdom fell in 586 BC and they were taken captive to Babylon. And as I was looking at all of these, I was thinking about the people of God going into exile in Babylon, very likely walking past the same mosaics that I was actually looking at, suspended on the walls in that museum. And it just thought me made me think, wow, imagine being taken from the promised land because of sin and rebellion and disobedience. The very things that Amos is prophesying about. And as you enter the land and the city, the fortress of your captors and your oppressors, you look at these massive mosaics. And I was looking at the same ones. And it just for me, it just brought through this, this, this huge picture of what God is doing and what he is accomplishing for his glory, even through taking his own people through suffering. And it's not like he didn't warn them about it. He warned them for really literally millennia that they need to turn to him and they need to seek him. And as Hebrews says again, no punishment seems pleasant at the time. <laughs> it's anything but, but later it reaps a fruitful harvest. Now, when I say in terms of the title of this message that our Savior is the sign, that is the, that is the context in which we should view all suffering. 
So is, is COVID punishment from God? Is, is COVID punishment to the world because of, because of all their morality and sin? I'm not, I'm not saying that. Let's not be that narrow. It's nice. It's, it's nice in one way to go to these easy, trite little answers for big questions, but they're far more layered and complex than that. But let's not take away from the fact that God is at work in these things. But the sign that we need in times of suffering and in times of prosperity, we must look to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And N.T. Wright says it this way, From now on, the summons to repentance and the announcement of God's kingdom on earth as in heaven come not through wars, earthquakes, famines, or plagues, or domestic accidents. They come through Jesus. So Jesus is the sign to whom people must always look. But certainly God uses suffering to get our attention. Because as Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. And, and so God sometimes graciously and lovingly comes into our lives and starts to knock away the support pillars. Whatever those might be, our comfort, our wealth, our security, whatever it is. To show us that we cannot stand without Him. Don't lean on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge Him. So what God is saying here to His people through Amos is, I'm removing all of the things that you look to, to give you comfort and strength and support. And I did all these things. Let's read through the list. It's fascinating. Uh, from verse 6, I gave you empty stomachs in every city. And it's interesting that the Hebrew literally says here, I gave you clean teeth. Not empty stomachs, but the point is, there was nothing in your teeth. You weren't eating. You had no food. It was famine. I gave you clean teeth, which implies empty stomachs and the other way around. And lack of bread in every town, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away, when you really need the rain. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none and dried up. People staggered from town to town for water. So there's the big, the macro, the, the fields and the areas, but also the individuals. People staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink. Yet you have not returned to me. What's the purpose of that? To reveal to you your need, your abject, absolute need of God. As Jesus says in John 15, without me, you can do nothing. Verse 9, many times I struck your gardens and vineyards. I struck them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig and olive trees, and figs and olive trees in, in the ancient Near East, and certainly in biblical, uh, the biblical context, are signs of prosperity and being established and, and sort of sorted, taken care of. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent plagues among you as I did to Egypt. I killed you young men with a sword along with your captured horses. Yes, foreign agents, I used foreign agents, but that was me. I filled your nostrils with a stench of your camps, a stench of death and disease. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew some of you as I did overthrow Sodom and Gomorrah. We, we probably remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot and what was left of the family that escaped from there. You were like a burning stick snatched from the fire. Now that burning stick, when, when we fiddle around, I'm a bit of a pyromaniac, and I think most South Africans love fire and love a brine. You fiddle with that stick, and eventually there's not, you, you pull it out, and there's, there's not much. You can't do anything with it. That's, that's the picture here. It's actually, incidentally, the picture in the previous chapter when, when, when God said, you'll be like... Um, what a shepherd is able to rescue from a wild animal, a piece of an ear or a leg, bone of a leg. In, in, in the context again, if, if you went back to the owner of those sheep, because most shepherds were not, didn't own the sheep, and you went back to the shepherd, to the owner, and he said, well, where, I'm missing a sheep here. Where are they going? He said, well, a bear took it, a lion took it. If you had no proof, you paid for that. 
But if you could come back with a fragment, a piece, you know, an ear, a piece of a bone, that's all that remained. You could prove that that had been captured, but it's of no use to anyone. Here's the picture here. I snatched you from the fire. You were being destroyed by your sin, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. So clearly we see here in Amos, the purpose of suffering is to draw his people God at work to draw his people back to him. And, and before, you know, when, when we're strapped with illness, when we're set aside, now we're, sometimes when we're flat on our back with disease or maybe COVID-19 or something else, as unpleasant as it is and as tragic as that is, that's sometimes the only way God can get our attention because we're so busy running around. We're so, our lives are so full of distractions. And then we leap to this, oh Lord, heal me, take this away. And it's like the Lord saying, are you kidding me? I finally got your attention. You're actually praying. You're talking to me. Let's engage. Let's fellowship. Let's journey through this. So God uses these things in our lives. But over all of this, we see what theologians call providence. Providence, the providence of the Savior. That's my third point. Providence is the gracious, loving work of God through everything that happens to bring us to a deeper place of relationship with Him that enables us to worship Him more meaningfully. And again, we see that in these, in, these, in these acts of discipline, judgment, it's God saying, I sent the plagues. I did this. I did that. It's actually a loving God stirring through these things, attempting to stir the hearts of his people. And as we saw last time, praise God for the remnant. Praise God for those who do respond throughout the history of, of the church to what God is saying. And what we need to do is stop at these moments of cry, trial and loss and crisis. And let's listen to God. Let's listen to God together. Let's hear, let's hear Him. Let's follow Him. Let's, let's, let's be in a place of intimacy and fellowship with him and and let's be aware as as far as is possible i think it's it's more possible than we think to be aware of the providence the hand of god as we look back on our lives i trust that you're able to see the providence of god you know many times we've complained to god about what you know what happened in our lives or maybe what didn't happen I think, again, from an eternal perspective, when we are with Jesus in glory, we'll thank God for the things that didn't happen. We'll thank God for the things that did happen, because from that vantage point, and only from that vantage point, we will see the providence of our Savior, as Philippians says, to will and to do according to His good pleasure. God is at work in all of these circumstances in the days of Amos, and the nation of Judah. And he's at work in all of the circumstances in our days and in our context, in our, in our country. God is at work. Are we able to discern? Are we able to, to follow? Are we, are, we, are we better, show, let's put it this way, let's ask this question. Are we better worshipers of Jesus now than we were before COVID came along? We should be. If we understand the providence of God. Now, understanding the providence of God, it's not, it's, it's, it's the opposite of fate. It's the absolute opposite of fate. It's not, ah, uh, we are, God's in control. We just abandon ourselves to that. God calls us to be actively engaged in his world and in his will. And a verse that we know very well, but we've missed the intent of it most of the time, certainly I have, is Romans 8, 28. God is at work in all things for the good of those who love Him and serve Him according to His purpose. Some translations say all things work together for the good of those. That's a very fatalistic, that's not an accurate translation. 
the actual implication and the way the language is structured in the New Testament Greek is that God is at work in all things. But more than that, God is at work together with us. That's what the word actually means. We get, we get our word synergy from this Greek word in Romans 8, 28. God is at work with us, together with us, in all things, for his glory and for our good. So it's not supporting fatalism. God is the Lord of the cosmos. It, scripture says he causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He also causes floods to wipe out rebels and refine the righteous. And the ancients understood and knew that God was using the environment and the weather. Now we come along with our modern sophisticated thing and we say, well, science explained how a hurricane, how a volcano, and, and some will use us to try and explain away God, but that can't be further from the truth. That just means we understand a little more of the mechanics of how these things work, but it doesn't negate the presence of God. God is saying here, I caused this to happen. I caused this to happen. We understand that God is in the world with us, Emmanuel, God with us. And he's working with us to bring about his purpose in our lives, which is to live a life of relationship, which is a life of worship. And so let's, let's look to Jesus. Let's see our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the great sign from God. And in the daily cut and thrust of life, as we try to adjust to a new, I don't want to call it normal, but a new reality in this time, let's seek to get closer to God. Let's seek to be more attentive to God. Let's seek to be more useful, available to be used by God in the lives of other people. And let me encourage you to to pray with people, and not just Christians. Pray with non-Christians. In all the years I've been praying for people, I, I can, I, and I'm talking about some 30 years of, of praying with people in all kinds of environments. I think there are three occasions. I'm honest, it's, it's probably only three occasions where people have said, no, thank you. Some go, oh, okay. Someone said to me, oh, I suppose it can't hurt. <laughs> but they don't say no. Many say, oh, yes, please, thank you. Well, thank you. Let's pray for people. I've just heard wonderful testimony today of someone in the workplace praying with a Muslim in the name of Jesus. And that, that dear person was weeping right through that prayer. Let's be available to God. Let's return to him. We're always, the bias of sin is pulling us away, but the Spirit of God is pulling us towards. Let's respond to the Spirit of God and turn to the Lord so that He never has to say to me, I brought all these things about. I used these events. I used these circumstances. Yet you have not returned. May we be the remnant. May we be those, whoever hears this message, those who respond, who return, who run as a child to their parent with, with bright, shining, big, fat smile and outstretched arms into his very presence and deeper into relationship with him. We, we cannot and we will not make an impact for Christ in the world if we're not seeking him with all we are and all we have. Our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is our sign. And He's calling us, calling us, calling us into deeper relationship with Him. May that be your reality today and every day. Amen. Stink kindness you lavished on us when the
the streams of forgiveness and the shade of Surely you 